Hello and welcome. I'm Alex and this is Cannonball, a podcast where we talk about the European literary canon and the history, culture, philosophy, art, and science that surrounds it. Over the next hour, we will be exploring this week's reading, which is a philosophical inquiry into the origins of our ideas of the sublime and beautiful by Edmund Burke. We will learn a bit about Burke and look at some passages from his book. Though we cannot meet and speak with these great men of the past, we can still access their writings into which they put the maximum of their thought and care, and which constitute a great cultural treasure. In studying their writings, we are not simply reading passages out of a book. We are making direct, if one way, contact with some of the great minds of history and being enriched by the contact, which is an excellent way to spend an hour. I produce this podcast in part to promote my new book publishing company, which you can see at volrathpublishing.com. That's V-O-L-L-R-A-T-H publishing.com. My books are of excellent print quality, low priced, and I offer free shipping anywhere in the United States. Edmund Burke was born in 1729 in Dublin, Ireland. From 1758 until at least 1789, he was the chief of the Annual Register, which was originally subtitled A View of the History, Politics, and Literature of the Year, which, published annually, records and analyzes the major political events of the year, along with various developments and trends throughout the world. While he was the editor from 1758 until 1789, 31 years, he apparently wrote the annual register single-handedly until 1765, which was the first seven years of its publication. The annual register began under Burke's steady hand in 1758 and continues to be published to this day, 265 years later. In reading about Burke, I found an engraving by James William Edmund Doyle depicting a meeting of a London dining club founded in 1764 by Burke, artist Joshua Reynolds, and the legendary English man of letters Samuel Johnson. The engraving depicts members of the club sitting around a table. Those depicted are Edmund Burke, Samuel Johnson, Joshua Reynolds, James Boswell, who was Johnson's friend and author of The Life of Samuel Johnson, which was a significant step in the development of the biography as a form. David Garrick, who, along with being a student and friend of Johnson, was a playwright, theater manager, and producer who influenced nearly all aspects of European theatrical practice throughout the 18th century, including the promotion of realistic acting rather than the bombastic style that had been popular before him. Pasquale Paoli, who was a Corsican patriot, statesman, and military leader who was at the forefront of resistance movements against the Genoese and later French rule over the island, and who was a role model for Napoleon Bonaparte in the latter's youth. Charles Burney, an English music historian, composer, musician, and friend of the great composer Joseph Haydn. Thomas Wharton, who was an English literary historian, critic, and poet, appointed Poet Laureate of the United Kingdom in 1785. And Oliver Goldsmith, an Anglo-Irish novelist, playwright, and poet. Other members of the club included Edward Gibbon, author of the six-volume History of the Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, and Adam Smith, author of An Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. Edward Gibbon reportedly described Burke as the most eloquent and rational madman that I ever knew, and Johnson admired his brilliance while considering him a dishonest politician. The club met once a week at 7 p.m. and once every two weeks when Parliament was in session. In the 20th century, Winston Churchill had desired to join the club but was rejected, and the club remains active to this day. I recommend trying to look up that engraving by James William Edmund Doyle. It's very cool to see this old picture of all of these different notable famous figures, mostly literary but also political figures from history, all sitting around a table together talking about whatever it was that interested them most. I'm always interested in learning about the people around a thinker about whom I'm learning and about the people who influenced them and the things that they read and influenced and heard. But often you don't get to see a nice picture of it as you do with that engraving. I'll try and include a link to it in the description where that's possible. Edmund Burke held and argued for positions on key debates of his time, including opposing the slave trade, pursuing the impeachment of colonial administrator Warren Hastings, and most famously, 
opposing the French Revolution. He published his Reflections on the Revolution in France in November 1790, opposing the revolution. And while there had been political violence by that point, he took this position two years before the execution of King Louis XVI and three years before the start of the Reign of Terror. So whatever we might think of the outcome in general of the French Revolution, Burke could sense before many people that there was trouble coming. In 1776, he referred to capital punishment as the butchery which we call justice. Listeners of this podcast will remember that Cesare Beccaria published his On Crimes and Punishments, which, among other things, argued against the death penalty in 1764, 12 years earlier, which may have directly or indirectly influenced Burke's views. In 1770, Burke wrote in Thoughts on the Cause of the Present Discontents, which was a pamphlet about the nepotism of King George III and the court's influence on the House of Commons, quote, When bad men combine, the good must associate, else they will fall one by one, an unpitied sacrifice and a contemptible struggle. End quote. Burke is often credited with having said, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. And while there is not any sourcing for that among Burke's writings, or a clear source among anyone else's either, he definitely wrote this similar line, which I think is a better one. Most of Burke's writing and work was in politics and political philosophy, rather than the type of relatively pure philosophy writing at which we will look today. For that reason, I will skip over most of it and say simply that he died in Beaconsfield in Great Britain in 1797. A Philosophical Inquiry into the Origins of Our Ideas of the Sublime and Beautiful was published in English in 1757, which was when Burke was about 28 years old. It drew the eye of prominent continental thinkers including Immanuel Kant and Denise Diderot. An early passage that I want to show you is not about the subject of the sublime and beautiful, into which he gets later, but about the manner of inquiry and of inquiry in general. Here, when he says the characters of nature, he means the letters, as though nature was a written text. Burke writes, quote, The characters of nature are legible, it is true, but they are not plain enough to enable those who run to read them. We must make use of a cautious, I had almost said a timorous, method of proceeding. We must not attempt to fly when we can scarcely pretend to creep. In considering any complex matter, we ought to examine every distinct ingredient in the composition one by one, and reduce everything to the utmost simplicity, since the condition of our nature binds us to a strict law and very narrow limits. If an inquiry thus carefully conducted should fail at last of discovering the truth, it may answer an end perhaps as useful, in discovering to us the weakness of our own understanding. If it does not make us knowing, it may make us modest. If it does not preserve us from error, it may at least from the spirit of error, and may make us cautious of pronouncing with positiveness or with haste when so much labor may end in so much uncertainty." End quote. Many modern professions and the way that the flow of information and the internet works discourage people from reporting the discovery found nothing. I looked into this matter in this way with this hypothesis, but my hypothesis was wrong and I didn't find anything. This is not very interesting news. It does not make a very good headline or tweet Scientists found nothing, but it is very useful information, partially because of what Burke just said, and it should be reported more often. This is, in part, what is called the file drawer problem in science. Burke writes on the imagination, quote, Besides the ideas, with their annexed pains and pleasures, which are presented by the sense, the mind of man possesses a sort of creative power of its own, either in representing at pleasure the images of things in the order and manner in which they were received by the senses, or in combining those images in a new manner and according to a different order. This power is called imagination, and to this belongs whatever is called wit, fancy, invention, and the like. But it must be observed that this power of the imagination is incapable of producing anything absolutely new. It can only vary the disposition of those ideas which it has received from the senses. Now the imagination is the most extensive province of pleasure and pain, as it is the region of our fears and our hopes and of all our passions that are connected with them. And whatever is calculated to affect the imagination with these commanding ideas, by force of any original natural impression, must have the same power pretty equally over all men." End quote. And notice there that he does not say... Whatever is calculated to affect the imagination must have the same power equally over all men. He doesn't say that. He says, whatever is calculated to affect the imagination with these commanding ideas must have the same power pretty equally over all men. And we'll get into what he means by that, but he's talking about a particular way of affecting the imagination. Otherwise, one could say, 
well, there's all kinds of movies and things that are produced to affect the imagination, and they clearly don't affect everyone in the same way. Certain people like this movie, other people like that movie, and this is largely a matter of taste, a subject about which Burke talks a lot, but this is another one of these books from whose notes I had to cut a lot of material because there was so much so I won't be able to show you everything that interested me. In discussing taste, he describes the difficulty of exactly determining matters of taste as being connected to the fact that those elements that affect taste can be judged only by degree, which is larger or smaller, more or less, and not by measure, being an exact quantity. He points out that it is much easier to measure quantities exactly, and that this ease is in part what has allowed mathematics to become so precise. This kind of thought of comparing math with other subjects that are not as easy to quantify always seizes my attention because I am both studying math independently and very interested in the question of how to quantify things that have not yet been quantified. This endeavor may seem misguided or frivolous, when you ask, say, how could one quantify human politics? And indeed, many buckets lowered into such wells have come up dry. But it is worth remembering that for most of human history, even the fields that we would today call astronomy and physics were studied largely without mathematics. And when I say most of human history, I'm including prehistory. I'm talking about at least the last 10,000 years and maybe the last 20 or 30,000 years. I don't know how old astronomy in its most primitive form is. Over time, certain brilliant minds uncovered connections between a field that they were studying and mathematics that had great explanatory power. And thereafter, that previously undiscovered connection, that previously unknown way in which mathematics could be applied to a real-world phenomenon, was used subsequently to explain all kinds of similar things. The fact that one could easily imagine, or indeed give examples of fruitless and false connections between math and physics does not preclude the existence of true connections. And the same may well be true for other fields which we have not yet effectively mathematized. Burke writes, quote, here is indeed the great difference between tastes. When men come to compare the excess or diminution of things which are judged by degree and not by measure, nor is it easy when such a difference arises to settle the point if the excess or diminution be not glaring. If we differ in opinion about two quantities, we can have recourse to a common measure, which may decide the question with the utmost exactness. And this, I take it, is what gives mathematical knowledge a greater certainty than any other. But in things whose excess is not judged by greater or smaller, as smoothness and roughness, hardness and softness, darkness and light, the shades of colors, all these are very easily distinguished when the difference is in any way considerable, but not when it is minute, for want of some common measures, which perhaps may never come to be discovered." End quote. He then generally gives a rough explanation of what taste is. This section on taste appears first in the book, and was not included in the first edition, but was added in the second edition. People probably asked him to say something about taste, and he did his best on such an elusive subject. He wrote, quote, On the whole, it appears to me that what is called taste, in its most general acceptation, is not a simple idea, but is partly made up of a perception of the primary pleasures of sense, of the secondary pleasures of the imagination, and of the conclusions of the reasoning faculty concerning the various relations of these, and concerning the human passions, manners, and actions." End quote. He then describes several classes of people in whom the lights of the imagination have been largely turned off. Perhaps you've met some people like this. Quote, there are others so continually in the agitation of gross and merely sensual pleasures, or so occupied in the low drudgery of avarice, or so heated in the chase of honors and distinction, that their minds, which had been used continually to the storms of these violent and tempestuous passions, can hardly be put in motion by the delicate and refined play of the imagination. End quote. I think most people have had the experience of being embarrassed to revisit some creative product that you enjoyed when you were younger. It might be a movie, or a song, or a book. Apparently this feeling tracks across centuries, since Burke describes it here. He writes, quote, In the morning of our days, when the senses are unworn and tender, when the whole man is awake in every part, and the gloss of novelty fresh upon all the subjects that surround us. How lively at that time are our sensations, but how false and inaccurate the judgments we form of things. I despair of ever receiving the same degree of pleasure from the most excellent performances of genius which I felt at that age from pieces which my present judgment regards as trifling and contemptible. 
end quote. Here he makes an important point to which he refers often in the text, that pleasure is not the absence of pain, or pain the absence of pleasure, as is often asserted, but that they are distinct feelings that can be recognized without reference to each other, and that there is a third, neutral feeling, which is neither pleasure nor pain, that is somehow positioned between them. He writes, quote, Many are of the opinion that pain arises necessarily from the removal of some pleasure, as they think pleasure does from the ceasing or diminution of some pain. For my part, I'm rather inclined to imagine that pain and pleasure, in their most simple and natural manner of affecting, are each of a positive nature, and by no means necessarily dependent on each other for their existence. The human mind is often, and I think it is for the most part, in a state neither of pain nor pleasure, which I call a state of indifference. When I am carried from this state into a state of actual pleasure, it does not appear necessary that I should pass through the medium of any sort of pain. If in such a state of indifference, or ease, or tranquility, or call it what you please, you were to be suddenly entertained with a concert of music, or suppose some object of a fine shape and bright, lively colors to be presented before you, or imagine your smell is gratified with the fragrance of a rose, or if, without any previous thirst, you were to drink of some pleasant kind of wine, or to taste of some sweetmeat without being hungry, in all the several senses of hearing, smelling, and tasting you undoubtedly find a pleasure. Yet if I inquire into the state of your mind previous to these gratifications, you will hardly tell me that they found you in any kind of pain, or having satisfied these several senses with their several pleasures, will you say that any pain has succeeded, though the pleasure is absolutely over? Suppose, on the other hand, a man in the same state of indifference to receive a violent blow, or to drink of some bitter potion, or to have his ears wounded with some harsh and grating sound. Here is no removal of pleasure, and yet here is felt is every sense which is affected, a pain very distinguishable." End quote. Part of what makes this text interesting is the degree of closeness with which Burke is trying to study his senses, but in addition to his senses, his sensations of an outside stimulus. There is, for example, on the one hand, the very pleasant sound that you could hear, but there is also your pleasant feeling in response to that pleasant sound which if you look closely and pay attention to your actual experience, you will notice them as distinct things. Trying to examine something like this so minutely, and Burke's efforts to articulate it, might seem like an effort in training turtles, but our senses are our only access point for the world. And as we saw in looking at Sextus Empiricus, our senses can often be highly flawed. For that reason, to look closely at them, at the moment-to-moment -moment experience of the impressions made on them and the sensations that result from those impressions. To understand all of this closely is a critical component in trying to understand the world. Burke strives to perceive his own senses closely and gets this information firsthand. He writes, quote, I can never persuade myself that pleasure and pain are mere relations, which can only exist as they are contrasted. But I think I can discern clearly that there are positive pains and pleasures which do not at all depend upon each other. Nothing is more certain to my own feelings than this. There is nothing that I can distinguish in my mind with more clearness than the three states of indifference, of pleasure, and of pain. Every one of these I can perceive without any sort of idea of its relation to anything else." End quote. An additional point is that he calls the pleasant sensation that accompanies the removal of a pain a delight to acknowledge the feeling of relief that comes with it without calling that a positive pleasure. Examples of this might be that when you are carrying something especially heavy and you set it down, you feel a kind of pleasant relief that Burke would call delight. He acknowledges that the word is not usually used that way, but he does it to distinguish that sensation from, for example, touching cool grass in the summer, which is pleasant, but one does not feel discomfort before feeling this pleasant feeling. This latter sensation, he would call pleasure. He then submits another important idea, that ideas capable of a powerful impression, either painful or pleasurable, are related either to self-preservation or society. 
quote, most of the ideas which are capable of making a powerful impression on the mind, whether simply of pain or pleasure, or of the modifications of those, may be reduced very nearly to these two heads, self-preservation and society, to the ends of one or the other of which all our passions are calculated to answer. The passions which concern self-preservation turn mostly on pain or danger. The ideas of pain, sickness, and death fill the mind with strong emotions of horror, but life and health though they put us in a capacity of being affected with pleasure, make no such impression by the simple enjoyment, end quote. He then first mentions what he means by sublime. He points out that ideas of pain and pleasure are not symmetrical opposites, but rather that ideas of pain and pain itself are more powerful sensations than ideas of pleasure and pleasure itself. He writes, quote, whatever is fitted in any sort to excite the ideas of pain and danger, that is to say, whatever is in any sort terrible or is conversant about terrible objects or operates in a manner analogous to terror is a source of the sublime. That is, it is productive of the strongest emotion which the mind is capable of feeling. I say the strongest emotion because I am satisfied. The ideas of pain are much more powerful than those which enter on the part of pleasure. Without all doubt, the torments which we may be made to suffer are much greater in their effect on the body and mind than any pleasures which the most learned voluptuary could suggest, or than the liveliest imagination and the most sound and exquisitely sensible body could enjoy." End quote. Discussing the power that a real phenomenon has over the art that imitates it, he gives the example of a production put on in a theater. Quote, Choose a day on which to represent the most sublime and affecting tragedy we have. Appoint the most favorite actors. Spare no cost upon the scenes and decorations. Unite the greatest efforts of poetry, painting, and music. And when you have collected your audience, just at the moment when their minds are erect with expectation, let it be reported that a state criminal of high rank is on the point of being executed in the adjoining square. In a moment, the emptiness of the theater would demonstrate the comparative weakness of the imitative arts and proclaim the triumph of the real sympathy, end quote. He then gives an interesting example of what we would desire to see, though we may not wish it would happen. Quote, we delight in seeing things which so far from doing our heartiest wishes would be to see redressed. This noble capital, the pride of England and of Europe, I believe no man is so strangely wicked as to desire to see destroyed by a conflagration or an earthquake though he should be removed himself to the greatest distance from the danger. But suppose such a fatal accident to have happened. What numbers from all parts would crowd to behold the ruins, and amongst them many who would have been content never to have seen London in its glory? End quote. This example is particularly interesting because it anticipates, two and a half centuries in advance, the popularity of apocalypse movies and TV shows that have populated our screens so densely over the past decade. If there were a button we could press to bring on the zombie apocalypse, very few people would press it, though not so few that I regret the absence of such a button. However, many people at least wonder how well they would fare amid the rubble of civilization. The notion is attractive enough to have drawn the attention necessary to produce all of these movies and shows. He comments on the importance of imitation. This is a far more potent force in society and in our lives than we generally would like to acknowledge. In fact, the default position of a human, and maybe the inescapable position, is that it is a kind of imitation machine or an imitating animal. I think this can be overcome to a certain degree, but it is very difficult. Much of what we think, say, and do is a result of our unconscious imitation of a crowd of people. Our parents, our friends, our teachers, but also actors, journalists, politicians, and others who have been placed in authority positions. Many people knowingly or unknowingly imitate an actor's manner of dress or how he behaves. Others will imitate how a journalist writes or talks. Others imitate how a politician thinks about a certain issue or creates the illusion of thinking. This is another reason why what you consume mentally matters. What you watch, what you listen to matters a lot because you will unconsciously imitate the behavior and speech of those people. How many of the words and phrases, and more importantly, your thoughts on a given topic, are merely copied from somewhere? I would submit that it's far more than you're consciously aware of. The same is true for me, of course. We have a lot of cleaning up to do. Burke writes, quote, it is by imitation far more than by precept that we learn everything. And what we learn thus, we acquire not only more effectually, 
but more pleasantly. This forms our manners, our opinions, our lives. It is one of the strongest links of society. It is a species of mutual compliance which all men yield to each other without constraint to themselves and which is extremely flattering to all. End quote. Burke there is, of course, saying that this imitation is actually a good thing, and the imitation of good actions and ideas certainly is a good thing, but it is not only good actions and ideas and words that we are exposed to. He then asserts a rule about how the choice of subject in a piece of art will tell us something about how whether its power derives from the subject matter or the skill of the artist in executing the imitation. He writes, quote, Herein it is that painting and many other agreeable arts have laid one of the principal foundations of their power. When the object represented in poetry or painting is such as we could have no desire of seeing in the reality, then I may be sure that its power in poetry or painting is owing to the power of imitation and to no cause operating in the thing itself. So it is with most of the pieces which the painters call still life. In these, a cottage, a dunghill, the meanest and most ordinary utensils of the kitchen are capable of giving us pleasure. But when the object of the painting or poem is such as we should run to see if real, let it affect us with what odd sort of sense it will, we may rely upon it that the power of the poem or picture is more owing to the nature of the thing itself than to the mere effect of imitation or to a consideration of the skill of the imitator however excellent, end quote. He then summarizes some of what he has said up to that point about pleasure, pain, society, self-preservation, and the sublime. Quote, to draw the whole of what has been said into a few distinct points, passions which belong to self-preservation turn on pain and danger. They are simply painful when their causes immediately affect us. They are delightful when we have an idea of pain and danger without being actually in such circumstances. This delight I have not called pleasure because it turns on pain and because it is different enough from any idea of positive pleasure. Whatever excites this delight I call sublime. The passions belonging to self-preservation are the strongest of all the passions. The second head to which the passions are referred with relation to their final cause is society. End quote. He later describes his object in trying to articulate all of this and delineate such an apparently intangible subject. Quote, the elevation of the mind ought to be the principal end of all our studies, which, if they do not in some measure affect, they are of very little service to us. But, besides this great purpose, a consideration of the rationale of our passions seems to me very necessary for all who would affect them upon solid and sure principles. It is not enough to know them in general, to affect them after a delicate manner, or to judge properly of any work designed to affect them. We should know the exact boundaries of their several jurisdictions. We should pursue them through all their variety of operations and pierce into the inmost and what might appear inaccessible parts of our nature. Without all this, it is possible for a man, after a confused manner, sometimes to satisfy his own mind of the truth of his work, but he can never have a certain determinate rule to go by, nor can he ever make his propositions sufficiently clear to others. End quote. He goes over the various groups of people who might have been able to plant a flag on this topic, but so far have not done so sufficiently. He mentions the circular and self imitative process in which much of the history of art, and indeed the history of philosophy and thought, has been trapped. I get a sort of wide open feeling, like standing at the edge of a cliff over a big valley when I try to imagine thinking or creating art in a way that is truly not caught in the trap of imitating others. There is, without doubt, a tremendous amount to be gained by studying the work and thought of the masters who have come before us. This is a principle that is absolutely central in certain fields, for example, in the study of classical music, you spend far more time on composers of the past than on living composers, and I would argue rightly so. But from what I can see of the formal study of visual art in universities, and that is an environment in which I have absolutely no experience, it seems that there is much less emphasis on first learning how masters of the past did a certain thing, and once you've learned their methods, then deciding either to apply them or to do something different. While that idea is central to the study of music, it seems largely absent from, or at least much more peripheral, in the study of visual art in its modern form. Either way, even if we are going to spend time studying what people of the past have done, 
we ought also to be trying to stoke our own hearth. Burke writes, quote, We might expect that the artists themselves would have been our surest guides, but the artists have been too much occupied in the practice. The philosophers have done little, and what they have done was mostly with a view to their own schemes and systems. And as for those called critics, they have generally sought the rule of the arts in the wrong place. They sought it among poems, pictures, engravings, statues, and buildings. But art can never give the rules that make an art. This is, I believe, the reason why artists in general, and poets principally, have been confined in so narrow a circle. They have been rather imitators of one another than of nature. And this, with so faithful uniformity, and to so remote an antiquity, that it is hard to say who gave the first model. Critics follow them, and therefore can do little as guides. End quote. Describing further the relationship between the sublime and horror, Burke writes, quote, The passion caused by the great and sublime in nature, when those causes operate more powerfully, is astonishment. And astonishment is that state of the soul in which all its motions are suspended, with some degree of horror. In this case, the mind is so entirely filled with its object that it cannot entertain any other, nor by consequence reason on that object which employs it. Hence arises the great power of the sublime, that far from being produced by them, it anticipates our reasonings and hurries us on by an irresistible force. End quote. Burke addresses several times arguments that apparently were popular at the time that certain emotional responses could be explained by certain conclusions of reason, that the mind had unconsciously drawn a certain conclusion and therefore behaved in a certain way. Such arguments are generally not popular now, and indeed, they seem rather optimistic. The more popular view of today is of our mind as being often pushed around by our emotions, or at least that our perceptions can be easily warped in this way. The preceding passage is an example of Burke arguing against such a position. Further still on terror and the sublime, he writes, quote, Whatever therefore is terrible with regard to sight is sublime too. Whether this cause of terror be endued with greatness of dimensions or not, for it is impossible to look on anything as trifling or contemptible that may be dangerous, end quote. And further, quote, a level plain of a vast extent on land is certainly no mean idea. The prospect of such a plain may be as extensive as a prospect of the ocean, but can it ever fill the mind with anything so great as the ocean itself? This is owing to several causes, but it is owing to none more than this that the ocean is an object of no small terror. Indeed, terror is in all cases whatsoever, either more openly or latently, the ruling principle of the sublime, end quote. Anyone seeking to do good horror writing, or indeed to create effective art of any kind, would do well to read Burke's text carefully and to contemplate it. He then enters the topic of how the role of clarity and obscurity affects our perception of the sublime. Quote, to make anything very terrible, Obscurity seems in general to be necessary. When we know the full extent of any danger, when we can accustom our eyes to it, a great deal of the apprehension vanishes. Everyone will be sensible of this who considers how greatly night adds to our dread in all cases of danger, and how much the notions of ghosts and goblins of which none can form clear ideas affects minds which give credit to the popular tales concerning such sorts of beings. End quote. He gives political and religious examples of this, and then describes the opposition between clarity and effect, that what is clearly perceived, because of its clarity, cannot affect the perceiver as much. Quote, it is one thing to make an idea clear, and another to make it affecting to the imagination. If I make a drawing of a palace, or a temple, or a landscape, I present a very clear idea of those objects. But then, allowing for the effect of imitation, which is something, my picture can at most affect only as the palace, temple, or landscape would have affected in the reality. On the other hand, the most lively and spirited verbal description I can give raises a very obscure and imperfect idea of such objects. But then, it is in my power to raise a stronger emotion by the description than I could do by the best painting." End quote. Further on this matter, he points out how words are by far the best means of transmitting the effect of an object in a mind. His latter comment about how clearness is an enemy of enthusiasm may explain in part why political speeches in general 
in particular those meant to stir the crowd, are so vague. Quote, the proper manner of conveying the affections of the mind from one to another is by words. There is a great insufficiency in all other methods of communication, and so far as a clearness of imagery from being absolutely necessary to an influence upon the passions that they may be considerably operated upon without presenting any image at all by certain sounds adapted to that purpose of which we have a sufficient proof in the acknowledged and powerful effects of instrumental music. In reality, a great clearness helps but little towards affecting the passions, as it is in some sort an enemy to all enthusiasms whatsoever." End quote. He then comments on how poetry, which is often obscure, is usually more popular among the masses than painting, which is characterized largely by clarity and exactness, or at least was in the 18th century when Burke was writing. Today we might point to the popularity of songs whose lyrics are so obscure as to be almost meaningless to demonstrate this point. Quote, among the common sort of people, I never could perceive that painting had much influence on their passions. It is true that the best sorts of painting, as well as the best sorts of poetry, are not much understood in that sphere. But it is most certain that their passions are very strongly roused by a fanatic preacher, or by the ballads of Chevy Chase, or the children in the wood, and by other little popular poems and tales that are current in that rank of life. I do not know of any paintings, bad or good, that produce the same effect. So that poetry, with all its obscurity, has a more general, as well as a more powerful dominion over the passions than the other art. And I think there are reasons in nature why the obscure idea, when properly conveyed, should be more affecting than the clear. It is our ignorance of things that causes all our admiration, and chiefly excites our passions. Knowledge and acquaintance make the most striking causes effect, but little. It is thus with the vulgar, and all men are as the vulgar in what they do not understand. The ideas of eternity and infinity are among the most affecting we have, and yet perhaps there is nothing of which we really understand so little as of infinity and eternity." End quote. First of all, it's worth it to mention there that the ballad of Chevy Chase and the Children of the Wood are both traditional English ballads. That's not a reference to the star of Christmas Vacation. But also when Burke in that passage comments on how poetry is more popular among the masses than paintings are, and he attributes this to poetry being vague and obscure and paintings being precise and exact. That certainly might be part of it, but there's another thing that should not be left out. A poem requires absolutely no external technology. You can be dirt poor and have never set foot even inside a house in your life, much less an art gallery, and you can hear a poem and learn it and recite it and this is a fun way to spend some time with your friends, is listening to and reciting this poem about this 14th century battle. That's what the Ballad of Chevy Chase is. But to even see a painting, you have to be physically in front of it. And if you have the opportunity to see it once, then there's no way for you then to convey that to your friend. You can tell him, oh, I saw this painting and it was really great, but that doesn't match the experience. Whereas in reciting a poem, all you need is your human voice and language, and you're giving 100% of the experience to whoever is in your vicinity. So I think that what Burke is talking about here is valid, but he leaves out this point about the spreadability of a poem. The way that it requires no technology makes it much easier for it to spread among the masses than a painting. He then gets more into the topic of infinity. He writes, quote, but let it be considered that hardly anything can strike the mind with its greatness, which does not make some sort of approach towards infinity, which nothing can do whilst we are able to perceive its bounds. But to see an object distinctly and to perceive its bounds is one and the same thing. A clear idea is therefore another name for a little idea. End quote. He gives throughout his text several excellent examples of the literary effects he describes, including quotations from the Iliad, the Aeneid, and Milton. I am including only the following. Quote, there is a passage in the book of Job, amazingly sublime, and this sublimity is principally due to the terrible uncertainty of the thing described. In thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon men, fear came upon me and trembling, which made all my bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern the form thereof. An image was before mine eyes. There was a silence, and I heard a voice. Shall mortal man be more just than God? We are first prepared with the utmost solemnity for the vision. 
We are first terrified before we are let even into the obscure cause of our emotion. But when this grand cause of terror makes its appearance, what is it? Is it not wrapped up in the shades of its own incomprehensible darkness, more awful, more striking, more terrible than the liveliest description, than the clearest painting could possibly represent it? End quote. Articulating the sublime further by means of the examples of various animals, including the ox, the bull, and the horse, animals that are strong but generally do not provoke a feeling of the sublime, he writes, quote, We have continually about us animals of a strength that is considerable, but not pernicious. Among these, we never look for the sublime. It comes upon us in the gloomy forest and in the howling wilderness, in the form of the lion, the tiger, the panther, or rhinoceros. Whenever strength is only useful and employed for our benefit or our pleasure, then it is never sublime, for nothing can act agreeably to us that does not act in conformity to our will. But to act agreeably to our will, it must be subject to us, and therefore can never be the cause of a grand and commanding conception." End quote. In a brief comment on the absence of certain things, he writes, quote, All general privations are great because they are terrible, vacuity, darkness, solitude, and silence. End quote. Returning to the topic of the infinite, he writes, quote, Infinity has a tendency to fill the mind with that sort of delightful horror, which is the most genuine effect and truest sense of the sublime. End quote. And then again, he makes an interesting observation about the nature of the mind itself, the means by which we access existence. He writes, quote, Whenever we repeat any idea frequently, the mind, by a sort of mechanism, repeats it long after the first cause has ceased to operate. After whirling about, when we sit down, the objects about us still seem to whirl. After a long succession of noises, as the fall of waters or the beating of forge hammers, the hammers beat and the waters roar in the imagination long after the first sounds have ceased to affect it, and they die away at last by gradations which are scarcely perceptible. End quote. This principle of the mind echoing in a certain way can also be seen in how we dream in the night about something we saw in a movie during the day, or how we more easily remember a word or concept that we have used recently, or how a bit of music can sometimes stay in your mind for a while. He later tells us the two components that are necessary to create the artificial infinite. Quote, succession and uniformity of parts are what constitute the artificial infinite. Succession which is requisite that the parts may be continued so long and in such a direction as by their frequent impulses on the sense to impress the imagination with an idea of their progress beyond their actual limits. Uniformity, because if the figures of the parts should be changed, the imagination at every change finds a check. You are presented at every alteration with the termination of one idea and the beginning of another, by which means it becomes impossible to continue that uninterrupted progression, which alone can stamp on bounded objects the character of infinity. End quote. He then reflects on a different kind of infinity. Quote, infinity, though of another kind, causes much of our pleasure in agreeable, as well as our delight in sublime images. The spring is the pleasantest of the seasons, and the young of most animals, though far from being completely fashioned, afford a more agreeable sensation than the full grown, because the imagination is entertained with the promise of something more and does not acquiesce in the present object of the sense. In unfinished sketches of drawing, I have often seen something which pleased me beyond the best finishing, and this, I believe, proceeds from the cause I have just now assigned." End quote. He then comments on an aspect of Stonehenge that I had never considered, largely because I had never thought about Stonehenge very much at all. He writes, quote, "...another source of greatness is difficulty. When any work seems to have required immense force and labor to effect it, the idea is grand." Stonehenge neither for disposition nor ornament, has anything admirable. But those huge, rude masses of stone, set on end and piled each on other, turn the mind on the immense force necessary for such a work." End quote. Archaeologists estimate that Stonehenge was built in about 2500 BC. So, 45 centuries ago, a group of men in the British Isles somehow hoisted stones weighing some dozens of tons, 13 feet into the air, and positioned them, so many of them remain there today. Burke gives another source of the sublime. Quote, Magnificence is likewise a source of the sublime. A great profusion of things, which are splendid or valuable in themselves, is magnificent. The starry heaven, though it occurs so very frequently to our view, never fails to excite an idea of grandeur. This cannot be owing to the stars themselves, separately considered. The number is certainly the cause. 
The apparent disorder augments the grandeur, for the appearance of care is highly contrary to our ideas of magnificence. Besides, the stars lie in such apparent confusion as makes it impossible on ordinary occasions to reckon them. This gives them the advantage of a sort of infinity." End quote. He comments on how the senses of smell, taste, and touch generally cannot produce a feeling of the sublime, then moves from the sublime to the beautiful, as the title of the treatise promises. Quote, it is my design to consider beauty as distinguished from the sublime and in the course of the inquiry to examine how far it is consistent with it. End quote. He defines beauty as follows. Quote, by beauty I mean that quality or those qualities in bodies by which they cause love or some passion similar to it. End quote. Thereafter defining love, he writes, quote, I likewise distinguish love, by which I mean that satisfaction which arises to the mind upon contemplating anything beautiful, of whatsoever nature it may be, from desire or lust, which is an energy of the mind that hurries us on to the possession of certain objects that do not affect us as they are beautiful, but by means altogether different. End quote. The circular logic need not go unnoticed there. Beauty is what provokes love, and love is the feeling we get when we contemplate the beautiful. Unfortunately, he specifies his meaning further. He begins by explaining what he thinks beauty is not. He really breaks a sweat trying to demolish the notion that beauty is connected to proportion. To this day, you can find arguments online about how beauty is the result of the facial features positioned in such and such a proportion. His arguments against this explanation of beauty are as strong today as they were in 1757. Quote, beauty hath usually been said to consist in certain proportions of parts. On considering the matter, I have great reason to doubt whether beauty be at all an idea belonging to proportion. He then points out another reason why mathematics has been able to develop as such a precise field of knowledge. It is precisely because the imagination is not interested in mathematics concluding a certain way that those who study mathematics are more able to follow its logic dispassionately. It is difficult to study and research history and politics for example, because the human doing the studying inevitably has biases about the topic, and those biases will likely come out in one way or another. Mathematics, because it is utterly foreign to much of our evolved brain, does not provoke our desire for a certain kind of narrative in the same way. Or so Burke argues here, quote, And it is from this absolute indifference and tranquility of the mind that mathematical speculations derive some of their most considerable advantages, because there is nothing to interest the imagination, because the judgment sits free and unbiased to examine the point. End quote. Discussing the relationship between proportion and beauty, he gives examples of how objects of vastly differing proportions can both be beautiful. These proportions in those days were measurements like that the neck should be the width of the calf and twice the circumference of the wrist, and similar things. He points out how swans have a long neck and a short tail, while peacocks have a short neck and a long tail, but both are considered beautiful. He points out the variety of colors that are considered beautiful in birds. He also says that if you're going to argue that people who have certain proportions are beautiful, you must show that all people who have these proportions are beautiful, and only people who have these proportions are beautiful. He argues that this cannot be done and that the proportions often listed in such discussions can be found in those considered beautiful, as well as those considered ugly, and also that there are many beautiful people who do not have those proportions at all. He then says, quote, You may assign any proportions you please to every part of the human body, and I undertake that a painter shall religiously observe them all, and notwithstanding produce, if he pleases, a very ugly figure. The same painter shall considerably deviate from these proportions and produce a very beautiful one, end quote. He further points out that those who argue for the importance of proportion in beauty do not even agree with one another, quote, And after all, how are the partisans of proportional beauty agreed amongst themselves about the proportions of the human body? Some hold it to be seven heads, some make it eight, while others extend it even to ten, a vast difference in such a small number of divisions. Others take other methods of estimating the proportions, and all with equal success. But are these proportions exactly the same in all handsome men? Or are they at all the proportions found in beautiful women? Nobody will say that they are, yet both sexes are undoubtedly capable of beauty, and the female of the greatest, which advantage I believe will hardly be attributed to the superior exactness of proportion in the fair sex. End quote. He then says, quote, I'm told that in most languages, the objects of love are spoken of under diminutive epithets. It is so in all the languages of which I have any knowledge. End quote. He gives examples from Greek and Latin, I can confirm that this is also true in Turkish. He then gives a nice example of Anglo-Saxon etymology. Quote, anciently, 
In the English language, the diminishing ling was added to the names of persons and things that were the objects of love. Some we retain still, as darling, or little dear, and a few others. End quote. Upon further consideration, this is certainly true. Duckling, gosling, foundling, and yearling follow the same principle. Burke continues, quote, In the animal creation, out of our own species, it is the small we are inclined to be fond of, little birds, and some of the smaller kinds of beasts. A great beautiful thing is a manner of expression scarcely ever used, but that of a great ugly thing is very common. There is a wide difference between admiration and love. The sublime, which is the cause of the former, always dwells on great objects and terrible, the latter on small ones and pleasing." End quote. He first goes over the following properties of beauty in more detail, and then summarizes them here. For our purposes today, the summary is sufficient, but the longer explanations are certainly worth reading. Quote, On the whole, the qualities of beauty as they are merely sensible qualities are the following. First, to be comparatively small. Secondly, to be smooth. Thirdly, to have a variety in the direction of the parts. But fourthly, to have those parts not angular but melted, as it were, into each other. Fifthly, to be of a delicate frame without any remarkable appearance of strength. Sixthly, to have its colors clear and bright, but not very strong and glaring. Seventhly, or if it should have any glaring color, to have it diversified with others. These are, I believe, the properties on which beauty depends, properties that operate by nature and are less liable to be altered by caprice or confounded by a diversity of tastes than any other. End quote. He winds up the discussion of the sublime and beautiful by comparing the two. Quote, on closing this general view of beauty, it naturally occurs that we should compare it with the sublime, and in this comparison there appears a remarkable contrast. For sublime objects are vast in their dimensions, beautiful ones comparatively small. Beauty should be smooth and polished, the great, rugged, and negligent. Beauty should shun the right line, yet deviate from it insensibly. The great, in many cases, loves the right line, and when it deviates, it often makes a strong deviation. Beauty should not be obscure. The great ought to be dark and gloomy. Beauty should be light and delicate. The great ought to be solid and even massive. They are indeed ideas of a very different nature, one being founded on pain, the other on pleasure. And however they may vary afterwards from the direct nature of their causes, yet these causes keep up an eternal distinction between them, a distinction never to be forgotten by any whose business it is to affect the passions." End quote. He then describes the possibility of forms in which the two, the sublime and the beautiful, are combined. Quote, in the infinite variety of natural combinations, we must expect to find the qualities of things the most remote imaginable from each other united in the same object. We must expect also to find combinations of the same kind in the works of art. But when we consider the power of an object upon our passions, we must know that when anything is intended to affect the mind by the force of some predominant property, the affection produced is like to be the more uniform and perfect if all the other properties or qualities of the object be of the same nature and tending to the same design as the principle. If the qualities of the sublime and beautiful are sometimes found united, does this prove that they are the same? Does it prove that they are any way allied? Does it prove even that they are not opposite and contradictory? Black and white may soften, may blend, but they are not therefore the same. Nor when they are so softened and blended with each other, or with different colors, is the power of black as black, or of white as white, so strong as when each stands uniform and distinguished." End quote. He then reflects on what he is trying to do in his treatise, whether he has been successful in doing so, and the inevitable stumbling of those who go but one step beyond the immediate sensible qualities of things. Quote, when I say I intend to inquire into the efficient cause of sublimity and beauty, I would not be understood to say that I can come to the ultimate cause. I do not pretend that I shall ever be able to explain why certain affections of the body produce such a distinct emotion of mind and no other, or why the body is at all affected by the mind or the mind by the body. A little thought will show this to be impossible. But I conceive if we can discover what affections of the mind produce certain emotions of the body, and what distinct feelings and qualities of body shall produce certain determinate passions in the mind and no others, I fancy a great deal will be done, something not unuseful towards a distinct knowledge of our passions, so far at least as we have them at present under our consideration. This is all, I believe, we can do. If we could advance a step further, difficulties would still remain as we should still be equally distant from the first cause. When Newton first discovered the property of attraction, 
and settled its laws. He found it served very well to explain several of the most remarkable phenomena in nature. But yet, with reference to the general system of things, he could consider attraction but as an effect, whose cause at that time he did not attempt to trace. But when he afterwards began to account for it by a subtle, elastic ether, this great man, if in so great a man it be not impious to discover anything like a blemish, seemed to have quitted his usual cautious manner of philosophizing, since perhaps, allowing all that has been advanced on this subject to be sufficiently proved, I think it leaves us with as many difficulties as it found us. That great chain of causes, which, linking one to another even to the throne of God himself, can never be unraveled by any industry of ours. When we go but one step beyond the immediate sensible qualities of things, we go out of our depth. All we do after is but a faint struggle that shows we are in an element which does not belong to us." End quote. And he summarizes the point finally, quote, I have before observed that whatever is qualified to cause terror is a foundation capable of the sublime, to which I add that not only these but many things from which we cannot probably apprehend any danger have a similar effect, because they operate in a similar manner. I observe, too, that whatever produces pleasure, positive and original pleasure, is fit to have beauty engrafted on it. He also observes how acting a certain way can make you feel that way inwardly. Quote, I have often observed that on mimicking the looks and gestures of angry or placid or frighted or daring men, I have involuntarily found my mind turned to that passion whose appearance I endeavored to imitate. Nay, I am convinced it is hard to avoid it, though one strove to separate the passion from its correspondent gestures. Our minds and bodies are so closely and intimately connected that one is incapable of pain or pleasure without the other." End quote. We have been told a thousand times that words are symbols for phenomena that the word calls to mind when we hear and read it. However, once again, turning his examining eye inward, Burke looks closely at what happens when we read and hear words and points out an interesting and undeniable truth. Upon on hearing words like, for instance, virtue, liberty, or honor. He writes, quote, I am of opinion that the most general effect even of these words does not arise from their forming pictures of the several things they would represent in the imagination, because on a very diligent examination of my own mind, and getting others to consider theirs, I do not find that once in twenty times any such picture is formed, and when it is, there is most commonly a particular effort of the imagination for that purpose. Indeed, it is impossible, in the rapidity and quick succession of words and conversation, to have ideas both of the sound of the word and of the thing represented. Besides, some words, expressing real essences, are so mixed with others of a general and nominal import that it is impracticable to jump from sense to thought, and from particulars to generals, from things to words, in such a manner as to answer the purposes of life. Nor is it necessary that we should." End quote. He demonstrates the point further. Quote, if I say, I shall go to Italy next summer. I am well understood. Yet I believe nobody has by this painted in his imagination the exact figure of the speaker passing by land or by water, or both, sometimes on horseback, sometimes in a carriage, with all the particulars of the journey. End quote. He then explains the power of words. Quote, now, as words affect not by any original power, but by representation, it might be supposed that their influence over the passions should be but light. Yet it is quite otherwise, for we find by experience that eloquence and poetry are as capable, nay indeed much more capable, of making deep and lively impressions than any other arts, and even than nature itself in very many cases. End quote. The source of this, he says, is in part, quote, that we take an extraordinary part in the passions of others, and that we are easily affected and brought into sympathy by any tokens which are shown of them, and there are no tokens which can express all the circumstances of most passions so fully as words, so that if a person speaks upon any subject, he can not only convey the subject to you, but likewise the manner in which he is himself affected by it. Certain it is that the influence of most things on our passions is not so much from the things themselves as from our opinions concerning them, and these again depend very much on the opinions of other men, conveyable for the most part by words only. End quote. He discusses once again the opposition between clarity and strength of expression. This is worth emphasizing. Quote, we do not sufficiently distinguish in our observations upon language between a clear expression and a strong expression. These are frequently confounded with each other, though they are in reality extremely different. The former regards the understanding, the latter belongs to the passions. The one describes a thing as it is, the latter describes it as it is felt. Now, as there is a moving tone of voice, an impassioned countenance, an agitated gesture, which affects 
independently of the things about which they are exerted. So there are words, and certain dispositions of words, which being peculiarly devoted to passionate subjects, and always used by those who are under the influence of any passion, touch and move us more than those which far more clearly and distinctly express the subject matter. We yield to sympathy what we refuse to description. The truth is, all verbal description, merely as naked description, though never so exact, conveys so poor and insufficient an idea of the thing described that it could scarcely have the smallest effect if the speaker did not call in to his aid those modes of speech that mark a strong and lively feeling in himself. Then by the contagion of our passions we catch a fire already kindled in another, which probably might never have been struck out by the object described. Words, by strongly conveying the passions by those means which we have already mentioned, fully compensate for their weakness in other respects. End quote. Those are the passages that I wanted to show you. Burke's points here are worth reflection for anyone who wants to enjoy art, be it visual, musical, literary, architectural, or otherwise, for anyone who wants to produce any art of this kind, but most of all for anyone who is a human interpreting the world with their human senses and wishes to think more deeply about why they react the way they do to certain stimuli. It might at first seem simple to explain the sublime and beautiful by their provocations of pain and pleasure, which are in part our feelings about self-preservation and generation, but first of all, it is certainly not simple. Applying Burke's perspective to almost any piece of art will provoke some interesting thoughts and discussions. Further, though, pain and pleasure are perhaps the most basic human experiences. They are hooked into our spinal cords and the primordial parts of our brains. Not everyone reacts to all art in the same way, but we almost all get a different feeling from J.M.W. Turner's Fisherman at Sea than we do from John Constable's Wivenhoe Park. These feelings are not random. The feeling provoked by the art reflects something about our humanity, just as the art itself does. That our art and perception of art would be oriented around terror and love, and would in turn be reflected in the sublime and the beautiful, is what makes art so absolutely human. If you enjoyed listening to this podcast, I hope that you will send the link to it to the readers in your life, and that you will buy some books for yourself, your family, and your friends from volrathpublishing.com. That's V-O-L-L-R-A-T-H publishing.com. As I'm making this recording in early 2023, I've only published one book, and that is an edition of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. But I have big plans for what is coming next, so if you want to help to invigorate, to strengthen, to energize, to celebrate, to honor, to steward the European literary canon by means of the printing of new high-quality editions of these classic works with the specially commissioned cover art that they deserve and carefully prepared footnotes that accelerate the flow of reading all for a good price, go order a copy right now for yourself and for the readers you know. With your support and love for and understanding of the true value of classic literature, combined with my knowledge of publishing, we can print a whole library of new editions of classic works, both famous and forgotten. Farewell. Until next time, take care, and happy reading.